Our first Bible reading today is from Psalm 34, verses 1 through 8, on page 550 of your Pew Bible, if you'd like to read along. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with, the, with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And the New Testament reading is from Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52 on page 1003. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. This is the word of our Lord. Good morning. I feel like I'm so blessed to have such a wonderful people like you as the congregation. I really mean it because I saw a cartoon the other day. Uh, which depicted a senior couple having a conversation in their in the back porch of their house. In the cartoon, the husband said to his wife, Huh, the new pastor wants us to smile in church. You know how I hate to try new things. <laughs> That's the cartoon. And I realized how much I'm blessed to have a wonderful congregation like you guys. All of you have generously cooperated with me in creating more welcoming and loving community in Jesus Christ. And I'm so proud of you for having opened yourself to each other. And now let's all rise and share the love and comfort of Jesus Christ making sure that everybody is encouraged and strengthened. I hope you don't, go, you don't go home and say, my pastor asked us to do more, even. <laughs> <laughs> At a busy airport, the passengers are seated waiting for the pilot to show up so they can get underway. The pilot and co-pilot finally appear in the rear of the plane and begin walking to the, to the cockpit through the center aisle. Surprisingly, both appear to be blind. The pilot is using a white cane, bumping into passengers right and left as he stumbles down the aisle. The co-pilot is using a guide dog. Both have their eyes covered with sunglasses. At first, the passengers do not react, thinking that it must be some sort of practical joke. 
After a minute, though, the engines start revving, and the airplane begins moving down the runway. The passengers look at each other, whispering among themselves and desperately looking to the stewardesses for reassurance. Yet, the, the plane starts accelerate, accelerating rapidly, and now people begin panicking. Some passengers are praying as the plane gets closer and closer to the end of the runway. The voices are becoming more and more hysterical. hysterical. When the plane was less than a hundred feet of runway left, there is a sudden change in the pitch of the shout as everyone screams at once, Ah! At the very last moment, the plane lifts up and is airborne. Up in the cockpit, the co-pilot breathes a sigh of relief and tells the pilot, You know, these days, the passengers seem not screaming as much as in the past. <laughs> so it's getting harder and harder to know when to take off. No one wants to get in the airplane controlled by a blind pilot, right? But today's passage is about blindness. Jesus healed a blind man named Bartimaeus, who was begging by the roadside. The man shouted out to ask Jesus for mercy, saying, Jesus, the son of David, have mercy on me. His voice was so loud and desperate that many people around him angrily responded and told him to be quiet. However, this blind man cried out even more loudly, The Son of David, have mercy on me. This story is introduced in all synoptic gospels. We can know that all, all three Gospels point to the same story because the blind man called Jesus the son of David. As you may know, the appellation, the son of David, was used to point to the coming Messiah as prophesied a long time ago by Samuel in the seed of David. That also is the reason why the crowds shouted, Hosanna! the son of David, Hosanna in the highest, as Jesus entered Jerusalem, because the son of David was the synonym of the Messiah in the time of Jesus. Interestingly enough, until Jesus entered Jerusalem with a chanting crowd, there were only a small number of people who called Jesus the son of David in the gospel. One was a Canaan woman, a Gentile woman, who came to Jesus for the healing of her daughter in Matthew 15. And in Matthew 9, there were two blind men who, were, who also came to Jesus, calling him the son of David. And finally, the blind man in today's passage, which is also introduced in Matthew 20 and Luke 18, called Jesus the son of David. In summary, until Jesus entered Jerusalem to spend his last days on earth before crucifixion, the only people who recognized him and called him the son of David was either a Gentile woman or a blind man. So we can immediately catch the meaning of the blindness in the Gospels, that the Gentile woman and blind man could see who Jesus was, while other people, including the disciples, including the Pharisees, failed to recognize Jesus, and thus they were blind spiritually. Especially in the Gospel of Mark, deals with the, uh, the healing story of the blind man in more unique ways. Only Mark introduced the name of the blind man as Bartimaeus. He was blind and he was a beggar. 
Mark tells us his name because he became a disciple of Jesus. In verse 52, in today's passage, he followed Jesus after being healed, for which Mark used the same Greek word, akolutheo, which means to follow, as he used in the cases of other disciples like Peter, John, or James, who followed Jesus. The most prominent uniqueness in the Gospel of Mark, though, is that its location in the book. Only Mark positions two different healing stories of blind men and then insert the prediction of Jesus about his own suffering for three times between two blind men stories. After healing a blind man in Mark 8, Jesus said he, that he had to suffer and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. Then we rise three days after. He predicted his death three times. Then Mark positioned another blind man's story, which is today's passage. In summary, the Gospel of Mark uses the healing stories of the blind man, blind man to point out that people are not just spiritually blind to accept the suffering of the Messiah, but they also fail to understand what it, what it requires to be his disciples. So double-blinded. As we talked about last week, the suffering of Jesus is the theme of the Gospel of Mark. We read Mark 10.45 last Sunday to summarize the entire Gospel where it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Because, because this verse was the foundation of my current theology, and because I contemplated this verse for a week to prepare the sermon last week, when I heard the special presentation of the kids last Sunday singing, I want to be more like you, Jesus, it immediately brought tears to my eyes. I love Jesus. I praise Jesus. But it is hard to say, I want to be like you, Jesus. Which means, according to Mark 10.45, my life is better lived if I choose to serve rather than being served. Many Jews, including the disciples of Jesus, did not like the idea of the suffering Messiah because they expected a tri triumphant Messiah. For them, the Messiah to come should be the son of David, figuratively and literally, because they believed that the role the role of the Messiah was to restore the glory of King David. The, the best time in the history of Israel. The Jews in Jesus' time aspired to the restoration of the glory of King David more desperately because they were colonized by the Roman Empire, the godless power of the world. Maybe it is the same for us. Who likes suffering? Nobody, right? We all want to live our lives enjoying the blessings of God. We love to hear the stories of health and wealth people gained after they believed in God. For too many, financial and physical well-being are always the will of God and the proof of God's existence for many Christians. Happiness and safety of life are the most important measures to consider their relationship with God. However, Mark brings this kind of ideas about the Messiah and our relationship with God into the story by, by depicting a group of people that rebuked this blind man. As we read, read the previous passage last week, 
two disciples came to Jesus and asked him to sit them on the right and on the left in his glory. Other disciples were upset because those two took one step ahead of them. Likewise, a group of people did not like the blind man asking Jesus for healing, healing his blindness, because they thought Jesus was going to gain the power of the Messiah, and the blind man, this blind man, was just a hindrance. Again, the two healing stories of the blind man in Mark, in chapter 8 and chapter 10, ask the readers important questions. Who is really blind? And what kind of Messiah do you expect? In other words, those who believe, those who believe that happiness and safety are the most important signs of salvation, misunderstand the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to serve, not to be served, and to give his life as a ransom. He also urged his disciples not to imitate the Roman authorities that exercised the power over the people but to imitate imitate the way of Jesus Christ. All of these contradictions are summed up in today's passage. What kind of Messiah do we like to believe between the suffering one and the triumphant one? I don't know about you, but I prefer the suffering Messiah. If you have someone or persons in your life who have accepted you no matter what, unconditionally loved you. You may know what I'm talking about. If you learn that the person of love has gone through so many difficulties and heartbroken moments in in his or her life, you trust the person even more because you see that his or her Emotional strength is the result of the internal coping abilities. This is the power of Jesus Christ. He is like an ant who who loves us so much. I saw a gift for an ant in in a gift store where it says, only an ant can give you hugs like a mother. Keep secrets like a sister and share love, share love like a friend. No one can play the three roles at the same time except for the end. Jesus loves, comforts us because he knows what suffering looks like. Jesus can be our mother, sister, and friend like the end because of his suffering. In the time of emotional downfall, we would rather go to a person of love rather than a person of strength. We would choose a person who can understand me over a person who is always calm and stoic. A female writer illustrated that she was surprised to see how many of those around her didn't want to hear about her struggles. But our Savior Jesus Christ is different. He is the one who knows our sufferings and who can sympathize with our weaknesses. As Hebrew 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. On the contrary, Mark 10 disavows the position of the people with the the opposite understandings. Like the disciples, who were vying for the first place in the glory, like the people rebuking the blind man, Some Christians focus on the triumph of Jesus too much and forget the reality of his suffering. 
They don't like the stories of people who are defeated by their weak difficulties in life. They praise the strong and they denigrate the weak. A lot of times, these people are quick to judge and blame those who are feeble or incapable of doing what they think they can. A French author, Jules Renner, said, Our criticism revolves around blaming other people for not having the qualities that we think we have. I think that, I think that it is very true for everyone and every society. Historically, there was a time when a lot of people thought that they could build a stronger country if only strong people survived. You might have heard the term Nazi eugenics, which played an important role at the center of Nazi ideology in 1930s. Under, under Adolf Hitler, they developed a program to target the people who they called the life unworthy of life. We know that they killed six million Jews, but they were not the only group targeted. Prisoners, people with physical and mental disabilities, including those who were identified as feeble-minded, were killed. The believers of Jehovah's Witness, black people, homosexuals, the members of other political parties, and the anti-Nazi resistant members were also targeted under the program. About 400,000 people were sterilized against their will, and hundreds of thousands of people were killed in the name of the creation of a superior race in Germany. What was the result of the experimental program? Did they become a better country? Did they secure the pride and happiness of the people? No, absolutely not. If you travel to Germany, Germany right now, you'll see Stolperstein. Stolperstein, which means literally stumbling stones, which are a little bit taller than other blocks in the street. So if you are careful, you may fall over the stones. They're about four by four size of concrete cube bearing a brass plate on the top, inscribed with the names and dates of their death by Nazi persecution. So far, Germans have installed more than 70,000 Stolperstein, stumbling stones, in Germany and in many other cities in Europe to express their collective guilt for perpetuating the Holocaust and killing so many innocent people under the Nazi eugenics program. You see, human pain is a formative experience. Sometimes it changes us, sometimes it shapes us. But we all know that we have to pretend it does not exist in the public eyes because most people are uncomfortable with others' sufferings. People don't see others' sufferings when they are not affected by them. When people are not affected by the suffering of other person, they think it does not exist. But the blind man in Mark chapter 10 shows us that there is a human suffering that cannot be hidden. There is a crying to Jesus, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. Even when others sternly order them to be quiet, they may become more desperate and cry, Son of David, have mercy on me. And the story of Jesus Christ in today's passage assures us that Jesus wants all of us to bring our burdens, our problems to him. At the same time, Mark shows us 
that there are the people who block the crying sounds just because they are uncomfortable. Folks, in fact, the Bible speaks of, of both a suffering Messiah and a triumphant Messiah. Triumph, triumph without suffering is a fairy tale, and suffering without triumph is a tragic drama. Yes, we find, find both in Jesus Christ. But keep in mind that, that suffering is guaranteed in our life, but triumph is not. Triumph is promised, but not guaranteed. So our strategy to cope with sufferings is to recognize small victories that represent the final triumph in the final day and to embrace our sufferings as a way of discovering Jesus Christ. A German theologian, um, Julian Moltmann, defines the Christian suffering like this. The, the suffering is a conflict of interest between God who has become man and man who wish to become God. A conflict is a crisis, a conflict of interest between God who has become man and man who wish to be God. He also said, the God of freedom, the true God is not recognized by his power and glory in the history of the world, but through his helplessness and his death on the scandal of the cross of Jesus. And brothers and sisters in Christ, I hope and pray that the story of healing Bartimaeus give you comfort first. When you are helpless, when the only thing we can do is crying or shouting out for help, this passage assures us that Jesus is there for us to listen and to heal our wounds as Natalie introduced the song. Psalm 34, verse 4 through 6 says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. The poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. That's our Lord. Secondly, we have to examine our hearts and spirits to find whether we grow love or fear in ourselves. Especially in the time like this, we have to examine our hearts more diligently. Are we growing love and care or are we growing fear and hatred? If it is not love, especially love for the people who can expect nothing but the grace of God, there is something wrong with our faith. Jesus showed his love for the blind man when others rebuked him to be silent. In this Jesus, we believe. And this Jesus, we confess as our Lord and Savior. As you may know, today is the Reformation Sunday that celebrates the Protestant uh, Reformation, which began with a German monk, Martin Luther, as he nailed the 95 Thesis on the door of the All Saints Church in Wittenberg in October 31st, 1517. His main purpose was not to start a different church from the Roman Catholic Church, but just to protest against the sale of indulgences. In a sense, the Reformation was a way to love and care for the people in the midst of the exploitation of the religious and political power of the time. The Roman Catholic Church at that time proclaimed the false message to the people, saying, 
As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs into heaven. That was the message of that time. But Luther insisted that the forgiveness of sins was granted by the grace of God only. Just like Luther, we may have different tasks in our time, but the substance of the task is the same as Mark 10 teaches us. Like the presentation of the keys last week, I would like to conclude, close my sermon with the same song. And I want to invite all of you to sing the same song with me. I want to be more like you, Jesus. I want to be more like you. I want to be a vessel you work through. I want to be more like you. Amen.